what we might want to do just uh, before uh, diving into things, um, we had sent some instructions for all of you uh, about downloading um, software. And uh, in a couple of hours, we're going to be starting a project where we're doing um, some spectral deconvolution with what's called the Konomics software. Um, anyone who was not able to download that software, just raise your hand. Okay. Well, I was able to download it, but I didn't get the activation license. Yeah, same. Okay, so there's three of you who don't have, four of you, five of you, five of you who don't have the activation license. So Jeff will work on getting five five access keys. Uh, for you. They will have to reply. But the, when did you guys send the email? I'm mean, following you. I sent it last night. Last night, no. Yeah. They will take probably 20 hours. I hope they will reply by today. They'll send you the, the link to the license, then you can activate. It. So yeah. Yes. Okay. So you sent last night. Weekday. How about you guys? You just sent last night. Well, again, this is a weekend. I think yeah, weekend. most companies work Monday to Friday. Well, it was July 4 weekend, right? Yeah. So if you sent it Thursday, Friday, there's no... Well, they, they're Edmonton-based, so okay. I think they, they only would have been on off on July 1st. But um, So hopefully they'll be sending you a key, uh, which would be about 8.30 or 9 o'clock mountain time, which would be 10.30 or 11. Uh, our time, which would correspond to about when we start the, the exercise. Um, if you're still waiting, um, you might want to pair up with someone. Um, in fact, there's a couple people here uh, who actually are experts in this and they in fact may, may end up uh, helping other people and maybe donating their computers to people who don't have their uh, access keys. Um, Okay, so that's sorted out. I think the other one was downloading XCMS. Um, anyone who was not successful in, in downloading XCMS, raise your hands. Okay. That's all right. That's all right. Because it depends on some uh, external li uh, library installing your system. So if you get errors, uh, and that's a nice graph. So over the coffee break, yeah, Jeff we can, will troubleshoot yeah, your R. If you have errors, uh, fail to install, just uh, talk to me. I we can go through and install the external uh, things. It depends on which, uh, what kind of operating system you're using. Okay, that's good. Um, anyways, uh, we're this is a new new room, new facilities. Um, and obviously every year as well, there's changes or adjustments to both the, the software that we commonly use and, and operating systems. So hopefully we'll, we'll squash those little troubling bugs. Um, okay, so these are the two standard slides that uh, Michelle has uh, already talked to you a little bit about. Um, and we're going to be starting into metabolomics here. Uh, all of the lectures I'll be giving uh, will have some uh, a slide like this, which is sort of the learning objectives. Um, it's sort of an outline of what we hope you'll be able to, to learn uh, over the next hour and a half. Um, and uh, again, this being a, an introduction, and we're really just trying to get people familiar with metabolomics, so we're all on the same um, plane here. Also to uh, look at some of the applications, and obviously many of you are applying metabolomics, which is good. Um, and, and then we'll look into some of the technologies, and this is what focus is. And, and uh, metabolomics is really, uh, we call it analytical chemistry on steroids. Uh, we're trying to do lots of analytical analyses, uh, often with many, many different tools. Um, so we're going to go through some of them, and we've got people with very varying backgrounds. Uh, so we'll try and get you up to the same speed. And then uh, also close off with this difference between targeted and untargeted metabolomics. And we'll talk about that quite a bit uh, through the next two days. You've seen the schedule. Uh, I won't go through that again. But um, this does give you day two. Um, so uh, this is what we'll be doing. And, and 
typically will wrap up by 5 o'clock. Um, and then on the last day, there'll be a bit of a survey uh, where we try and get your feedback. So if there are things that you'd like to see or would hope you could have seen in, in next, uh, next year's um, uh, metabolomics uh, presentation or workshop, um, put that down, take notes. Uh, it'll help students who come later on. And it may also allow us to develop uh, uh, different kinds of workshops as well. So here's the first slide, um, and this is a way I often begin with uh, describing metabolomics, uh, with what I call the pyramid of life. Uh, at the base of the pyramid is the genome, and the genome codes well, for proteins, um, and the collection of all those proteins is called the proteome. Uh, proteins are there really to function as catalysts in many cases or as transporters to move small molecules in and out or to produce small molecules or manipulate and transform them. So the proteome actually then largely helps code for the metabolome. Um, the uh, reason why I'm showing this as a pyramid is, is in part because one depends on the other, which then depends on the other. Um, but there's also feedback. Uh, metabolites uh, affect uh, gene function, a lot of feedback control. Some of the very first operons in genetics were identified as, as metabolite-based operons. But there's also progression. Um, small changes in the genome can have very profound effects at the top of the pyramid, uh, up at the top of the metabolome, and we'll learn about that. There's also progression in terms of uh, environmental effects and physiological effects. And this is something that's particularly important. So the genome is largely unaffected by the environment. What you just ate uh, this morning for breakfast is not affecting your genome. Uh, maybe if you ate the same stuff every day for 30 or 40 years, it might subtly affect your genome. What you ate this morning or what you're breathing is mildly affecting your proteome, but it's only a few proteins, insulin, glucagon, ghrelin. Um, but what you just ate or what you're breathing or drinking actually is profoundly influencing your metabolome even as we speak. Uh, it changed almost the instant that you took in um, any, anything, uh, and it will change your metabolome for up to several hours afterwards. So that's one thing that's particularly important, is that the metabolome is, is significantly influenced by your environment. And in that regard, the metabolome is an excellent indicator of the phenotype. It's a quantitative measure of the phenotype. The phenotype is the sum of the genome and uh, environmental interactions. Um, another aspect that we tend to forget is that um, physiology is reflected in metabolome. Arguably, uh, genes coding for our organs are, are important for the development of organs. Uh, different organs have different proteins and proteomes. Um, but um, we have specific organ, organs, like the stomach, the liver, the kidney, uh, which are developed specifically for metabolism meaning that metabolism is compartmentalized in many different parts of our bodies. Same is true in plants. Same is true actually even in some complex single cellular organisms. And we tend to view, unfortunately, in the world of metabolism and genomes and proteomes as everything is just a single cell, and it isn't. And in fact, um, what we measure metabolically in plants or animals by looking at biofluids represents often the sum of many different physiological influences. And we also, also have to understand that measuring metabolomes in different fluids, blood, urine, saliva, cerebral spinal fluid, um, bile, all of those reflect what's going on in these different organs. And therefore, physiology can ca be captured particularly well through metabolomics and is significantly influenced um, by metabolism. The term metabolomics, we all use it. Uh, sometimes people will call it metabonomics, where the L is replaced with an N. 
although largely most people are using the metabolomics term. The definition, I think everyone knows, uh, but I, I, I just to reiterate, it's largely, in the, as with the case of genomics, which has been around for a lot longer, it's high throughput technologies, looking at all the genes in a given cell tissue organism, and so for metabolomics, it's the same definition, high throughput technologies, but it's not the genes we're looking at, it's small molecules, metabolites, but we are looking at cells, tissues, or organisms. And I think everyone here who's doing metabolomics is looking at probably those different uh, aspects of metabolism. A definition of a metabolite, this is one that's challenging because there's some people who have very different views and I still have people, collaborators coming up to me and saying, I hear you do metabolomics, can you measure these proteins for me? No, uh, metabolomics is not measuring proteins. Typically it's measuring small molecules, the metabolite uh, or molecular weight we usually use is a cutoff of about 1,500 Daltons. So we can measure peptides, maybe 12 or 13 residues, that counts. Large lipids, some actually get up to 2,000 Daltons. So that 1,500 Dalton cutoff isn't perfect, but I think most of us understand what we mean by small molecules. Um, unfortunately, the rest of the world does it. So we'll look at this, uh, as I say, we'll be talking about, um, and if you look through databases that talk about metabolites, you'll see things like some short peptides, oligonucleotides and sugars, nucleosides and organic acids, and the list goes on. It includes endogenous mo molecules, but also includes a lot of things that we find outside. Um, so that includes foods and food products, food additives, toxins, pollutants, and drugs and dr drug metabolites. The challenge with metabolomics for at least omnivores like humans or uh, mice and rats um, or plants growing in the modern world uh, is that they, uh, we consume other metabolomes. Uh, I ate um, several fruit metabolomes this morning. Um, and um, if we eat meat, we're eating a metabolome of beef or lamb or fish. Um, there's other components to the metabolome. Uh, we produce our own metabolites. Uh, we consume uh, those metabolites, but we also have uh, gut microflora that live in our large intestine and actually many different compartments of the body all through the gut. Uh, and they produce products. So it also includes microfloral, microbial products. Um, typically with modern technology, uh, metabolites include the things that we can detect and limited detection is something on the order of picomolar, uh, but most people and most instruments, it's more on the level of nanomolar. So that's a metabolite, a metabolome, um, formal definition. That's a complete collection of small molecules, so less than $1,500. And that can be in a cell, an organ, a tissue, or an entire organism. And it helps to define that. So you might say, I'm looking at the urine metabolome. Uh, that's a component of, say, an organism's metabolome. Um, um, but uh, to say that you're looking at the human metabolome largely means you have to look at all of the compartments, all of the organs, all of the tissues. As I said, when we talk about metabolomes, uh, we are often looking at both the endogenous molecules, the things that uh, are produced by the organism uh, or are needed by the organism, as well as the exogenous, which includes things that the microflora produce, includes things that we eat. Um, there are many transient molecules in metabolomics. We know about some of them. We still have yet to measure others. These are molecules that may exist for fractions of a second. There are others that persist for decades. There are other molecules that we have yet to actually measure, but based on the chemistry, we have inferred their structure. You'll find those sometimes drawn in, in pathways. The metabolome itself is also something that's defined by current uh, technology. So the genome um, has been defined. The human genome is fully measurable. We know pretty much the exact number of bases. It's not going to change or grow, except maybe over a course of millions of years by small increments. 
The metabolome is something that will vary as our technology improves. The size of the metabolome will increase because we can detect more. So we still really don't know the true size of the human metabolome or the Arabidopsis metabolome or the mouse or rat metabolome. We don't know the complete collection of secondary metabolites in plants. So it's still ill-defined, whereas we have a pretty good handle on the exact number of genes, bases, uh, and even proteins in many organisms. So in terms of plants, based on detection and reports in the literature, we think there are about 200,000 different chemicals that includes primary and secondary metabolites in the plant kingdom. Could be much larger, in fact I'll argue it, it is, and we'll show you a little later. Microbes are not as complex as plants. Um, the number of 60,000 is sort of just pulled from the air. We're still not sure, but microbial um, uh, complexity is, is quite large. We draw many antibiotics and exotic compounds from microbes. Mammals have about 20,000 detectable endogenous metabolites. So whether it's humans or mice, it's, it's pretty much the same metabolome, same kinds of compounds. The only thing that differs is probably their concentrations. So mammals actually, although they might be regarded as the most complex organisms, probably have the simplest metabolism, whereas plants, um, which uh, we might regard as fairly simple, have perhaps the most complex metabolome. And the reason for the complexity of uh, metabolism in plants is because they can't move. They can't run away from predators or from parasites. And so what plants have evolved is the capacity to wage chemical warfare. And this is how they battle uh, both pests and parasites. It's how they uh, avoid being eaten uh, by producing toxic compounds. It's how they protect themselves. And so this lack of mobility is this actually spawned this remarkable complexity in, in the plant metabolome. In terms of the human metabolome, I mean, we could put the word mouse or rat or um, horse or cow, um, relatively similar or very similar. Um, we know in this graph really illustrates um, both the range and concentrations, where we mark it from picomolar to molar, um, and the number of compounds that have been recorded or identified, um, either quantified in some level or confirmed through uh, experimental techniques. So there's about 19,700 endogenous metabolites in the human metabolome. Uh, that's in a database called HMDB. Humans take drugs. Um, there's about 1,400 that are known. The range in concentrations that you'll find in various tissues or fluids typically is in the submillimolar range down to picomolar, whereas the endogenous metabolites cover this full range of about um, 12 orders of magnitude. Um, people eat foods, and in fact, the concentration of food metabolites and food derivatives um, is roughly comparable to what we find for drugs. Um, there's a lot more. The variety of food components is nearly 30,000 based on what we know and has been measured. Drugs are metabolized into drug metabolites. And they're at much lower concentrations, an order of magnitude at least, um, or several orders of magnitude. Uh, but drugs break down to drug metabolites. In some cases, the drug metabolites are actually the active component. In other cases, the drug metabolites are the toxic components. So the very lowest end, hopefully well below micromolar, usually in nanomolar, you'll find uh, various toxins, pollutants, environmental chemicals that are produced by modern society. Um, those are also tracked. There's about 3,200 that are common. These include pesticides and herbicides and uh, polyaromatic compounds that are used in transformers, which are in all of us, whether you like it or not. Um, and as I say, hopefully these are at very, very low concentrations. So the collection of metabolites that might be in the human body at this stage would 
come to perhaps 40,000. Um, and that wouldn't be in a single person, it might be in a population of several thousand individuals. Because um, not everyone takes all 1,400 drugs, and not everyone eats every variety of food, and hopefully not everyone has been exposed to every toxin. Um, so that's a fairly large variety, but when we think that there's something on the order of 35 million different compounds that we know, this is actually a small fraction. And it's an important thing to remember. Uh, those of you who've heard of PubChem often are, are drawn to it because of the sheer size. But 99.99% of the compounds in PubChem have never left the lab. They're not part of the metabolome of any known organism, nor will they ever be. And so this is an important thing when you're trying to search. So if you've ever done proteomics or genomics, are you going to hunt for a gene by looking for that gene in every organism? No, you typically look for the gene for the organism of interest. Same thing with a protein experiment. So in the case of a metabolome, it's important to know both what organism you're working with, but also know that you're working with natural compounds, not synthetic ones. Now, though, what I gave you in that graph is the, uh, essentially the known metabolome. These are things that have been detected or measured. But there's also what we'll call the theoretical metabolome. And if we had infinite capacity to measure the lowest concentrations, uh, we know that there's probably on the order of 100,000 different lipids in the human body. But as I said, many of them are not detectable or have not been detected. We also know based on the number of drugs that are used, uh, and that are roughly seven to eight metabolites for each drug, that there should be roughly 10,000 different drug metabolites. Only about 1,000 have actually been characterized. We also know, uh, based on the foods we have, uh, many foods are broken down uh, through phase one and phase two metabolism. And so if there's about 25,000 different foods, assuming there might be four or 25,000 different food components, there might be four or five metabolites produced for those. So there's perhaps 100,000 different food breakdown products, if you want, or secondary metabolites. And then our own metabolites, our own endogenous uh, metabolites, many of them are also modified. Our liver thinks that they might be foreign and will transform them. And that could be anywhere from 10 to 50,000 compounds. We really don't know. So the theoretical metabolome is not 20 or 40,000, but probably on the order of 300 or 400,000 molecules. So that's a scale, and those are estimates. And every year, we're modifying those estimates as we learn more or as technology improves. Does anyone have any questions about that? Again, it's yeah. quite introductory. I have. Uh, in the comparison between a variable uh, organism, etc., like tissue, or humans, and plants, do you use them the same scale of concentration? Uh, what reference liquid do you use it to refer to? The, the data, what I gave there was, at least for the human, uh, was, was data that we had either measured ourselves or found in the literature uh, over the course of about seven or eight years of compiling that data. So those are the concentrations that you will find in, in, in data humans, resources. Okay, but how do you compare humans to plants? Um, so I didn't give you any specifics about the concentrations for plants, um, so it, it, it varies tremendously um, with, with plants. Um, you know, my own recollection of what we've seen with uh, plants is that we'll see things um, in the millimolar, high millimolar concentrations for certain tissues, and things like glutamine and glucose. Um, and obviously the secondary metabolites, some of them are well below uh, nanomolar uh, levels. So the range is there, uh, and, and uh, it may vary with other organisms. So in terms of um, metabolomics and its importance, um, I probably don't have to convince most of you, but I think 
it's a challenge for the rest of the world. Um, and it's something that I've, I guess, been uh, pushing for for probably more than a decade. Um, most people believe that the only important molecules are, are genes and proteins. And certainly as someone who went through biochemistry um, and who is still a, a structural biologist, uh, that's kind of the, the brainwashing that I went through as well as a student and as a researcher. Um, and I think it, it's been a struggle to try and get people interested in, in metabolism, partly because it's not well taught and also because it's an area where people feel like it just doesn't count or that the, the molecules aren't that important. But maybe these statistics might might be useful. And these are statistics that I'd hope you would try and convince your colleagues who look down upon the work that you might be doing as being irrelevant. So basically, of the common clinical assays that are used today, and I'll, I'll emphasize the word common, but if you go into a doctor's office, 95% of the assays that your doctor will run are testing for small molecules. 90% of the known drugs are small molecules. Even though the vast majority of R&D work in drug companies is focusing on proteins, still, the vast majority of, of drugs that are both introduced and are known are small molecules. Half of all the drugs that we know of actually are derived from metabolites. In fact, hundreds of drugs actually are metabolites. Um, but they may be found from plants or exotic bacteria or, or microbes. But the inspiration for those drugs is drawn largely from metabolites and the structure of metabolites. A third of the known genetic disorders, genetic diseases, um, are directly involved small molecule metabolism. And then of course, most proteins and enzymes would not function without small molecules, and we tend to forget that. We typically draw hemoglobin without the heme, or uh, superoxide dismutase without the zinc or the copper, but each of those proteins would not function without um, those cofactors. Likewise, uh, we tend to forget, and it's usually not drawn in your keg pathways, that small molecule metabolites are integral to signaling far more than we realize. And unfortunately, people still today, when they get their list of metabolites, immediately go to the keg pathways and try and explain what they're seeing based purely on metabolism, when nine times out of ten it's about signaling. Metabolites, when I do that pyramid, are, are really the canaries of the genome. And when we say canaries, it's the analogy is the canary in the coal mine. Coal miners used to have canaries in cages that they would put uh, either hanging up in the coal mine or wear them on their uh, helmets, and if a canary stopped singing, you knew that you were in danger of uh, either a methane explosion or, or gas explosion, because uh, canaries typically die very quickly when they're exposed to high concentrations of CO2 or methane. Um, so that's the term canary in a coal mine. It was an early warning system, but it was also a way of amplifying signals that you couldn't easily detect. So in that regard, uh, metabolites uh, can be amplified by a factor of about 10,000 over just a single uh, gene mutation. And this is the fundamental basis to why metabolites still are used in so many clinical assays. Because it's kind of like looking for a, a needle in a haystack if you're trying to find a single base mutation that might be causing a gene uh, dysfunction or a metabolic disorder where it's often pretty easy to measure um, um, certain metabolites, especially if they're amplified by a factor of 10,000 over the normal level. I mentioned before about the sensitivity of metabolomics, particularly to what we eat, drink, or breathe. And this is just illustrating uh, the effect of the metabolome on what someone's eating. Uh, within seconds, uh, you'll see profound changes uh, in the metabolome due to various physiological and metabolic responses. Um, and these are a consequence of enzymes uh, acting on things, a consequence of organs changing. Uh, 
Um, and this will go up and down radically for uh, hours after you've eaten a meal. In terms of your proteome, um, whether it's uh, plant or animal, it barely changes. Um, in the case of humans, it's just a few proteins. And as I said before, the genome does not change over time. It's, I mean, it's supposed to be very static. That's critical for that. Thanks to a lot of work that was done last century, largely in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, a fair bit of metabolism is understood. And thanks, you know, we now have these keg pathways, so we know about the catabolism and anabolism of, of various molecules. We don't know very much about the signaling, but we do know about the uh, breakdown and formation of many, many molecules. And in fact, the most complete sets of pathways still belong to metabolism. Metabolomes are connected to the genomes and the proteome. And the fact that the metabolome is connected makes it uh, particularly suitable for uh, systems biology. And it's a typical paradigm, I think, I've seen over and over, that people doing metabolomics typically have the broadest understanding or largest systems understanding of a biological system. Because in order to measure the metabolome, they also have to appreciate the proteome and the genome. Whereas people who study the genome are largely oblivious to the metabolome and only marginally aware of the proteome. And the same with people doing proteomics. So just to reiterate on that, small molecules, whether it's the uh, nucleosides and nucleoside phosphates that are um, obviously constituents of every piece of DNA and every piece of RNA. It's, every protein is made up of 20 amino acids. Um, the lipids are absolutely crucial to cellular structure and tissue structure. Um, we also know that small molecules are the source of essentially all the cellular energy. It's not the proteins, it's not the DNA. And as I said before, the small molecules play a key role in both keeping enzymes functioning, and then you could argue that really enzymes only evolved to help hold certain small molecules in proximity uh, so that they could function more efficiently. Uh, and that the signaling is, is critical for many metabolites. So this last statement, that the genome and proteome largely evolved to catalyze the chemistry of life and the chemistry of small molecules, I think is true. Uh, living systems or lifelike chemistry can occur in the test tube. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember um, various reactions, Mars, um, uh, probes that they sent in the 1970s and 80s, they weren't sure whether life existed on Mars because they were actually getting positive reactions that seemed to suggest life existed. Uh, so, you know, production and conversion of, of you know, CO2 and H2O to sugars and sugars to CO2 and H2O, um, the replication of certain molecules, these do happen spontaneously. Uh, those are the, that's the chemistry of life, but to make it happen efficiently, you need genes and proteins. So metabolomics, uh, because it has that connectivity and because it explores that connection between the genome and the proteome, helps enable systems biology and it helps people, I think, rather than thinking of metabolomics and proteomics and genomics as separate entities, to think of them as the same. And the way that we're able to do that is, is through things like bioinformatics. And this is largely what this course, this workshop will focus on. Obviously, we'd like to be able to teach people hands-on how to use mass spec or NMR and GCMS, but that usually takes about a week and we'd only be able to have about a third of you uh, taking that. It would probably cost about 10 times more than what you're paying for this. So this is a way of at least giving you some flavor or taste of what metabolomics is. Applications. Um, in your introductions, I think a lot of people became aware or talked a little bit about how they're using metabolomics in their research. Um, there's lots of other applications. 
metabolomics is used in, in toxicology testing in a, in a very large way. Um, people are trying to develop biomarkers uh, in monitoring drugs and clinical trials, phase three and phase four, it's also used. When we ferment things for wine and beer, metabolomics is used. A quality test uh, for uh, foods and beverages also perform. Nutraceuticals, uh, quality control assurance, metabolomics. People will phenotype uh, responders and non-responders using metabolomics in the drug field. Water quality or environmental metabolomics is picking up. One of the first applications of metabolomics is actually looking at uh, oil uh, from the petrochemical industry. It was an organic mixture produced by organisms. Um, the most widespread clinical application of metabolomics is actually in inborn errors in metabolism testing. It is a true application of metabolomics, and there are dozens of metabolomic biomarkers that are tested uh, every day, hundreds of thousands of times a day in North America and Europe. Nutrient and nutritional analysis, metabolomics. Blood and urine analysis, cholesterol testing, that's all examples of metabolomics. Drug compliance monitoring, transplant monitoring, and a variety of imaging applications. So those are just a few. The list goes on and grows every year. Um, so there's a tremendous number of applications. People may not use the word metabolomics or metabonomics, um, but um, in reality it is. So I'm going to switch gears and we're going to talk about uh, the methods or technologies in metabolomics. But before doing that, again, were there any questions that, that people had with respect to uh, some of the background? <coughs> So this is a standard metabolomics workflow. Um, so it can start with cells, it can start with tissues, plants, animals, whatever. So it may be a, a solid sample. In most cases, although not in all, most cases people will take those solid samples and will extract something. So the idea is to fluidize the sample. Now in some cases you can actually work with a solid sample and um, that's fine. It's a little more difficult. In other cases, you may not try and perform an extraction. You may simply just take fluids that are excreted. So in the case of mammals, it's urine and blood. Um, but you can also get uh, excreted fluids from, from plants and, and even from microbes. Um, and the reason why we like to work with fluids is because it's a lot easier to do the analytical chemistry on fluids. Uh, we can run them through columns and we can put them into or inject them into mass specs. So from the biofluid, which may have been extracted from tissue, we start doing our chemical analysis. And so it's typically uh, HPLC, LC, mass spec, GCMS, NMR. And what we produce is typically a spectrum. This is an NMR spectrum. It could be a GC, LC. And if I didn't have the scale here, most of us couldn't even tell what, whether it was a chromatogram for an NMR or mass spec or GC or LC. The data analysis is where we're going to be focusing on for most of today, but for the next 20 or 30 minutes, I'll be talking about this, the chemical analysis approach. So in the field of metabolomics, uh, this pyramid rears its ugly head again, but it's something that I think is, is relevant and maybe one reason why people look down at their noses at metabolomics. And this has to do with the quality and extent of coverage. With genomics, whether it's humans or other mammals or even plants, we can routinely sequence and measure all of the genes. And it's something on the order of about 20,000 genes that we can find in most complex organisms. Uh, we can also, through transcriptomics, measure the expression of those same 20,000 genes. We go up to proteomics and we look at the same organism, and let's just say it's humans for state, state of argument. Um, a good proteomics experiment can identify and semi-quantify about 5,000 proteins. Now, with proteome, human proteome may be 100,000 proteins, so we're technically only measuring uh, you know, about 5% of it, but 5,000 is a big number. It's not as big as 20,000. 
On the other hand, a very good metabolomics experiment will typically only identify about 200 compounds. And yet, I've been telling you that at least in the case of human metabolomes, uh, it's perhaps several hundred thousand compounds that are there. Um, and, and so 200 out of 200,000 is pretty abysmal. So the completeness in coverage as we go from genomics to proteomics and metabolomics um, it, it scales as I've shown here. So it gets progressively smaller even though the pyramid itself is essentially inverted in terms of the number of known uh, components. So that's a weakness. Why is it an issue? Well, the problem is that um, it's an issue of complexity uh, or diversity. In genomics, we can sequence genes because we just have to worry about the chemistry of four different molecules, which are largely the same. And so we've worked out through enzymology, although you can actually do chemical sequencing, um, methods to characterize DNA very easily, very routinely. It's a chemical, largely, process. Proteomics also is relatively easy because we're just dealing with 20 different types of amino acids. And again, it's just one chemical class. And so we know the chemistry of how to break up um, amino acids. We can sequence by uh, mass spec. We can also do chemical sequencing through end degradation. So the detection, the manipulation, the processing of genes and proteins is actually pretty simple. But the diversity and complexity of the metabolome is many, many times greater than it is for the proteome or the genome. And so that's why it's so tough. So rather than one instrument, which we typically use for DNA sequencing, or one instrument that we'd use for transcriptomics, or maybe one instrument that we use for proteomics, metabolomics requires many instruments. We use separation technologies, uh, complete electrophoresis, liquid chromatography, HPLC. We use a variety of mass spec instruments, high resolution, low resolution. We use NMR. We even use crystallography. We use gas chromatography, which they never use in proteomics or in genomics. We use a variety of detection methods, including fluorescence and ultraviolet. So just about every, every analytical tool has to be employed to be able to measure that chemical diversity. So I'll talk about some of them, and maybe we'll begin with chromatography. And again, many of you are probably familiar with it. So won't dive into it a whole lot of detail, but chromatography is obviously a separation method. And typically we'll be using these same terms a few more times, but there's a, a mobile phase which things are dissolved in. And they, the mobile phase contains the, the metabolites of interest, and then it passes through a stationary phase. This is the, the white stuff you'll find in most columns. It could be silica or it could be uh, cephidex or some other uh, compound. But essentially, um, there's differential partitioning. Uh, you're separating based on the fact that the, the small molecules in the mobile phase interact with the stationary phase. And they will partition or flow down at different rates. So we have things like column chromatography and thin layer chromatography, like liquid and gas and affinity chromatography. There's a variety of ion exchange and size exclusion, gravity and high pressure and ultra high pressure methods. So the varieties are considerable, and they depend on both uh, their cost and availability. The one that we mostly use in metabolomics is high pressure or high performance liquid chromatography. The technology was developed largely in the early 70s. Pressures we work with are, are thousands of pounds per square inch. And we use, rather than what you have with gravity feed, which are particles that might be measured in millimeters, um, they're typically working with microns or even submicron particles. The detection capacity actually with chromatography uh, is quite impressive. Uh, this is why we can get down to potentially picomolar. Um, and chromatography can be used to separate both polar and nonpolar compounds. Most of us use reverse phase chromatography, but that's largely restricted to working with non-polar uh, molecules. 
hydrophobic ones, lipids if you want. It's characterized where we have a, a very uh, hydrophobic stationary phase and we use a fairly polar organic mobile phase. Very few people use normal phase HPLC, but that was the very first form of HPLC that was developed. It's not as good at separating, um, and that's partly because of the choice of a polar stationary phase and often a non-polar mobile phase. However, uh, what's been picking up in recent times is a form of, of, of normal phase chromatography called HILIC. So it's a hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography. And instead of nonpolar molecules, it's really good at separating polar molecules, things like organic acids, amino acids. And it has a typically polar stationary phase and a kind of a mixed uh, polar nonpolar mobile phase. HPLC columns can be made up of different materials. The very first ones are made out of glass. Uh, most of them now are made out of stainless steel uh, or another material called peak. Uh, small columns are typically used uh, for analytical work, large columns for preparative work. Most of what we do in metabolomics is done with analytical columns. And you can see that the internal diameters can be as small as, as one millimeter, and they can be measured from 20 millimeters to half a meter. So really big columns, really long columns um, are typically the preparative ones. So the particles, those two or three micron size particles, are typically round, made up of sort of porous silica. So this is a, a microscope image of those particles, very, very spherical. But on them, they're decorated with a variety of organic molecules. And so this is an uh, octadecanoic, uh, um, or octadecanoate, or octadecane, uh, stuck to the uh, outside of the uh, silica beads, but you can also have shorter for forms, and so this is what we call a C18, 18 carbons, C4, 4 carbons, which is less hydrophobic. Uh, there can be also uh, benzyl groups that are attached. Again, depending on the chemistry, you can change uh, what the retention times are, what's attracted, what the separation is. <coughs> The size and width uh, of the column, the, the size of the, the beads, has a lot to do with how efficient your separations are. So short columns are not so good for separating things. Long columns are. But you'd like to use short columns if you have very little time, because this takes a long time to do the separations. Um, you can still stick with very short columns, but if you change the bead size, say from five microns to something like one and a half microns or even submicron, you can greatly improve. So you can improve the separation efficiency or resolution by going to small, small beads or long columns. With uh, HPLC, the process is typically to take a solvent, uh, and this could be whether it's gravity feed or HPLC, but typically with high pressure, you'll have your solvent and then you have a, a pump, which is applying the solvent at very high pressures. It's pushing things in, and then midstream you'll inject your sample. The sample then goes into the column. Um, things are separated, and then you'll have a detector. It could be an ultraviolet, it could be a fluorescence detector, it could be something like evaporative light scattering. Uh, from there, you'll measure it on the chromatogram and uh, process your data. We can also use gradient uh, HPLC. In this case, we use two solvents, some cases three solvents. And if you're looking at um, metabolomics for um, uh, lipid separation, often a, a three solvent gradient is preferred. For each solvent, you need m both pumps and mixers. Same process in terms of the analysis, same sort of detection. So the result is we get a chromatogram. The intensity often corresponds to the amount of material, and the position has to do with essentially the affinity to the column matrix. So stuff that comes off late 
at uh, 30, 40, and 50 minutes, strongly attached to the caudal material. Stuff that comes off at the beginning flows easily through and is typically more polar if we're looking at reverse phase HPLC. Now, in the case of UPLC, uh, which some of you use, uh, how many people actually use UPLC MS in their metabolomics? One, two, three. How many people have used HPLC in their metabolomics? So UPLC, the, the idea there is to work at much, much higher pressures, uh, but also much smaller um, bead sizes. And essentially, as you shrink the beads, you have to apply more pressure. So that's why it's called ultra-high pressure, ultra-high performance liquid chromatography. Uh, but it allows you to get separations on the short columns in short times that you would have normally got using HPLC on long times, long columns. So now, talked about liquid chromatography, there's another form called gas chromatography, and this is what we'll talk about now. Um, it's another way of separating molecules, um, and it's been used for a long time, uh, decades. How many people use gas chromatography? About half of you. How many of you use liquid chromatography in general? So again, about half. So the gas chromatography is, is not suitable for, for proteins or DNA. It's, it's ideal for small molecules. And it's ideal for molecules that vaporize. So you have to deal with typically either volatile molecules or molecules that you can convert to volatile forms. Um, so the separation isn't involving a fluid. That's not your carrier. It's actually, uh, or mobile phase, it's actually a gas, usually something like helium. It's got to be fairly inert, so that's why we go for these noble gases. Um, the column itself is lined with some kind of polymer, that's, uh, and then the, these uh, molecules, volatilized molecules, move through and are partially adsorbed to the surface. Uh, the columns are very, very long, often uh, 10 meters in length. Whereas in HPLC, we're talking about things that are 50 millimeters or less. Um, internal diameter, very small, very narrow, a couple of millimeters. The way that we get uh, molecules to be volatile is we derivatize them with trimethylsilane. And that allows them to stay in the gas phase. So trimethylsilane is, is done through sort of a two-step process. There's, we'll take some compounds, let's say it's a sugar, and we'll do some methanolysis or uh, methoxime addition, but we'll try and get um, some of these groups um, methylated, sort of stabilizes them. Um, and then we'll react them with trimethylsilane, um, and we'll produce, in this case, uh, four TMS, or a molecule containing four TMS components. You can also end up where the reaction is incomplete and we may only have one with, say, this TMS is not there, or this TMS derivative is not there. So the derivatization process is both an extra step that you don't see with HPLC and a complicating step because reactions are never 100% complete. So for a single molecule, you may actually end up seeing four or five different peaks. And that's an important issue that you need to remember when you're looking at GC GCMS. Um, once you've derivatized and volatilized the sample, then you essentially inject it, essentially largely as a, uh, well, initially as a liquid, and then it vaporizes very quickly. And you push it through with helium instead of acetonitrile as you might with uh, LCMS. And you get the same kind of separation. Things that are uh, stick to the column come off more slowly. Things that bounce through the column quickly come off very quickly. And this is a type of GC chroma chromatogram. And one thing about GCMS is you get a much higher, if you want, plate count. The resolution is much better than LC. HPLC or UPLC. So that's, that's a, a very appealing feature of GCMS. Peaks are very narrow, 
And like LC, um, the peak intensity roughly corresponds to um, the amount of material that's there. In GC, the columns don't have to be straight. They can be coiled because you're basically dealing with a gas flow and also because you're dealing with columns that are very long. The columns themselves are lined with material, so they're not packed like they are with HPLC or UPLC. So they are lined with a polysiloxane polymer. And that's what the molecules are interacting with as they bounce down through the column. So there's a surface adsorption phenomenon that you're detecting. What you do in gas chromatography, because it is actually very reproducible, far more reproducible than liquid chromatography, is that you can use a thing called retention time or retention index to figure out what a molecule is. So the retention time is just that time where you see the peak coming off. So it's the time taken for an analyte to pass through a column. So a typical GCF run might be 30 minutes. So you're seeing peaks coming off at you know, 1.2 minutes, 7.63 minutes, 18.42 minutes. Those are your retention times. So the retention time varies with the compound, with the column, with the flow rate and pressure. But if you use the same columns, same flow rate and pressure, same temperature, and these are all described in every GC experiment, you can, from one day to the next day, to the next week, to the next year, largely get the same retention times. Now you can further improve the time by coming up with what we call a retention index. And that's more general, because columns have different lengths, um, sometimes there's a bit of variation. So if you pass through a set of alkanes, six or seven alkanes, into your column, you can calibrate your retention times and convert them to a retention index. And that is largely universal. So the retention index for a given column under standard conditions, which are usually reported and pretty consistent, uh, you can identify a, a compound based on its retention index alone. Now that doesn't happen all the time, and people usually insist on having more than just the retention index provided. But it's a very powerful method that's unique to gas chromatography. So here's an example where we send something in, we've got two peaks, and uh, we do this the next time with another sample. Here might be our calibrant standard, which we tells us how much was there, and if we know it was the same that was injected. And we can see here, obviously, the area under this peak, coming off at exactly the same time, is much greater than this. We can quite easily quantify how much is there and um, um, use GCMS in a quantitative, or GC in a quantitative way. So retention time, the retention index tells us what it is. The area under the curve tells us how much. So again, just another shot of a biofluid, GCMS. Uh, if you compare that to the HPLC one, much better overall, much finer resolution. Um, the only disadvantage is that many of these peaks actually represent alternate derivatives of the same compound. So you have to then worry about uh, separating or identifying those, those extra derivatives. So key to GC and critical to LC, although not absolutely critical for LC, is to have a detector. So in LC, we can actually use UV or fluorescence. And in fact, there are many, many good metabolomic assays that are purely fluorescent, LC fluorescent-based methods. But for GC, and obviously many of you um, working on LC, the, the detector of choice is the mass spectrometer. So it's a very sensitive detector and allows you to further distinguish and characterize molecules based on their atomic or molecular weight. So mass spec, how many of you use mass spectrometry in your metabolomics experiments? Um, so in the case of mass spectrometry, uh, this is a typical one, this is a time of flight. Um, I think most of you would know that uh, through mass spec, we identify compounds by their mass, 
And many compounds can be uniquely identified by their mass if we have sufficient mass resolution. Um, with the highest resolution uh, instruments like FTMS, we can measure uh, below one part per million, uh, which is 0.0001% of the mass. Uh, with large proteins, we can measure to within one Dalton for 40 kilodalton protein, uh, or one atomic mass unit, again, which is usually sufficient to uniquely identify proteins. So mass spectrometry is used in metabolomics and proteomics. It's coupled to gas chromatography, it's coupled to liquid chromatography, and then we also will use mass spectrometry coupled to itself, so that's tandem mass spectrometry, and that too is a very powerful approach for identifying uh, compounds by their fragment patterns. So in the case of mass spec, um, in the early days, and it's not so far and long ago, even just uh, 10 or 15 years ago, um, resolution of mass spectrometers was, was not particularly great. Um, the ideal situation is you want to be able to measure the monoisotopic mass. And this is an example of a high resolution mass spectrum of some high molecular weight, I don't know, lipid. Um, and so we can see for this, this is a corresponding monoisotopic mass. This is the mass of the most abundant isotopes, so carbon-12, um, proton-H, uh, not deuterium, uh, sulfur-32. Um, these are all of the, the most abundant ones, and that's the mass. But what you're seeing here are the isotopomers, which correspond to the addition of one proton, roughly, um, changing mass. So that might be a C13 or an N15 variant. In the old days, all of these peaks actually would be merged with your mass spec because the resolution was so poor. And so what you were most interested in was the average mass, because that's all you could measure. Um, so you'll still see, um, basically to handle lower resolution instruments, people quoting both a monoisotopic mass and an average mass for given molecules. So those extra peaks that you will now see with higher resolution mass spec, as I say, are a function of the existence of uh, the abundant isotopes, proton, carbon, C, chlorine 35, sulfur 32, whatever. But then there are the rarer isotopes, deuterium, C13, chlorine 37. Um, so if we'd look at something like chlorobenzene, um, we would calculate its monoisotopic mass is 112.008 Daltons, and this is the monoisotopic mass. But we'd see peaks roughly one Dalton <coughs> apart because there are either C13 derivatives or deuterium derivatives or two Daltons apart because we may have two carbon C13s uh, two deuteriums, or one chlorine-37. And then you can do this as well for the variations with other isotopes and other combinations. The intensity of those peaks corresponds to the isotopic abundance. So chlorine-37 is not a rare isotope, whereas deuterium is very rare. Carbon-13 is, rel carbon is relatively abundant. And so that's probably the most common isotope that we typically see with, um, or isotopomer that we will see when we look at, at um, mass spectrum of, of uh, metabolites. So the result is that you'll actually get a, a, a distribution of peaks, in this case for the chlorobenzene, of about uh, six different peaks with different intensities and different masses, but it is all the same molecule. And so this is an issue when you are analyzing uh, uh, MS data with high resolution instruments where you have to essentially not view these as six different compounds, which people unfortunately do all too often. You have to then de-isotope um, the spectrum and make sure that you're merging or eliminating those peaks so that you can more correctly um, quantify or perform relative quantification. Mass spectrometers um, are uh, basically composed of three components, an ionizer, a mass analyzer and a detector. Um, 
Typically, when we look at a mass spectrum, this is a real mass spectrum, this is for aspirin, uh, we will see uh, peaks. It looks like a chromatogram. It's just that the peaks are much, much narrower. And rather than measuring, say, time, we measure mass to charge ratio. And we have an intensity, which is what we saw before with the chromatograms from GC and LC. So this just sort of puts to words what I was saying before. The height of the peak, unfortunately, in mass spec means almost nothing. It has nothing to do with um, quantity. Um, it has a lot to do with um, how uh, an ion flies. And, and this has made mass spectrometry, this is the Achilles heel to mass spectrometry, and that it's not terribly quantitative. When we talk about a mass spectrometer, we talk about resolution and resolving power. Um, so the width of the peak is a measure of resolution. And the way we measure resolving power is the line width of the peak, or delta M, over the mass. Um, so it could be the, the, something that we might call from difference between two masses that we can separate. So if we have two masses closely spaced, um, could we separate those two? So this is a peak that you'll see in a mass spec if you zoom in. As I say, the peaks are very, very narrow, but they will have a, a width. And we can look at that delta M, and we can see that the two peaks here are resolved at, say, a 10% half height. Most of us use a 50% half height, and this is used historically both in NMR and in mass spec, and in optics, which is where the word resolution first appeared. And so we use a half height line width to, to resolve two peaks. So this is an example of a resolution for both a high resolution and a low resolution instrument. A TOF is a high resolution instrument. And what we can see here, this is for a single compound, same compound, pure, we're seeing about six, seven different peaks. These are the isotopomers. These are the carbon-13, deuterium, nitrogen-15, oxygen isotopes for this particular uh, compound. Um, this is a low-resolution instrument. This is an ion trap, a linear ion trap. And this is providing you just with one big mound um, where we essentially get the average mass of this compound, whereas with this, we get essentially the um, monoisotopic mass, which is this one down here, and then all of the isotopomers. So if we had um, the average mass here, 3484, here is uh, the monoisotopic mass, and these are just essentially examples based on a blue curve, low resolution, where you have a resolution of 1,000, red, gain, not very good, resolution of 3,000, so that's characteristic of quadrupoles and ion traps, but then as you start getting into TOF instruments or you start getting up into Orbi traps or FTMS, you get this remarkable resolution and very, very fine details where all of the isotopomers can be detected. So this is a more complex view of the mass spec where we talked about ionization, mass analyzer, detector, but this is just you know, we separate, we've talked about that, we have vacuum systems which are critical for mass spec, but there are different ways of ionizing uh, small molecules. Um, so ionization methods are critical for metabolomics, they're also critical for things like proteomics. In, in metabolomics we have several choices, unlike in proteomics. One of the favorite approaches is to use what's called electron ionization. This has historically been used for 50 years or more. And it's ideal for small molecules. And it's coupled to most GCMS techniques. There are also chemical ionization methods, again, also used for small molecules. They can also be used uh, in, in GCMS and even um, um, some LCMS applications. Electrospray ionization, which is a soft ionization method, which is what most people use uh, because many people used to be in proteomics and shifted into metabolomics, and so they're reusing those, those instruments. 
and another soft ionization technique called MALDI, matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization. And it can be used for small molecules, but because the matrix that's used as often contains many small molecules in it, you typically can't see things below about four or 500 Daltons. So MALDI is somewhat limiting in terms of, of doing um, metabolomics. So EI, or electron impact ionization, as I say, is the preferred method for GCMS. And it's a very standard method that uses a standard 70-volt uh, um, uh, voltage differential. Um, so it has a, um, and a cathode set up uh, which draws electrons uh, off of a, of a plate. The electrons come flying off at the 70 uh, electron volts. And they collide with the analytes that are coming off the gas chromatogram. Those electrons strip off the electrons of the analyte, producing these positively charged molecules, but they also crack up or break up the molecule in somewhat um, definable components. So samples introduced by gas chromatography, gas phase molecules as they come in, there's that filament, which might have rhenium or tungsten, but it's the, it's the electrons that are being torn off those metals come flying into um, the, the molecules, the gas phase. The electron, the energy of the electrons is much greater than the energy holding covalent bonds of these molecules. So you get these mass fragments. And then they're sent out through a repeller, which pushes the positive ions out through the port. And that's where we pick up with the, the mass analyzer. So if we looked at methanol, thanks to electron ionization or electron impact, methanol can be turned into a positively charged parent ion, but it can also be uh, stripped of a hydrogen. It can be fragmented into a, a methane ion and a hydroxyl ion. It can also be fragmented further into this triply, um, triple bonded molecule and stripped off of another hydrogen. So these are fragments that are known to occur in methanol. And they have characteristic masses. And this is what you would measure uh, with a GCMS of, say, methanol. And these, this fragmentation is somewhat predictable. There are people who, if they've been doing uh, EI uh, for a long time, and I'm not one of them, but there are people I know, who can kind of look at both a molecule or even a spectrum and figure out what the components are. Uh, so they do the fragmentation in their head. There are programs, computer programs, that also can do some of this. But this is an example of, a, if you want, an EI mass spec, fragmentations of, of methanol. Where we can see the parent ion, but it's usually not the most intense. Uh, it's, it's all the other ones that are fragmented. Soft ionization methods. Did you have a question? Yeah, about the fragments, do you usually see all of them, or you can see some of them? Um, it depends on the sensitivity and scanning rate of the instrument. And so there's a few issues related to um, you know, what you can see and what you can't see. Um, the, um, um, so yeah, it, it's variable. Um, the, um, so in terms of the soft ionization methods, um, there's the MALDI approach. Um, which is to put your metabolites or your tissue into a, a cyanohydroxycinnamonic acid matrix. Um, there are now matrix-free approaches, but the idea is you blast your sample with a laser, it explodes. So you, it's hard to call it soft, but it actually is because the molecular ions actually remain intact. Or electrospray ionization. Electrospray is the most common one in metabolomics. In this case, typically we have our solvent coming from an HPLC or UPLC system. It flows through a very, very small um, uh, capillary. Um, and then around the capillary, you have essentially um, a metal uh, sheath, um, which essentially has a uh, fairly high voltage difference between these two sides. The result is that this high voltage and then this flow of, of liquid 
causes essentially uh, a spraying effect, an aerosol. So if you've ever sprayed something from an aerosol can, this is essentially what this is doing. Um, and it causes a, a cone to form, spraying out things uh, in, in tiny, tiny droplets, which are then sent through a series of, of uh, skimmers of, of different uh, voltage um, gates to accelerate uh, the ions, but it's also a series of vacuums that then dry the the solvent particles to very, very tiny particles. So here's your ca capillary. Um, solvent comes out, there's this high voltage which sprays the, um, the droplets all over the place. They fly through a vacuum and they evaporate very, very rapidly, but they don't evaporate into nothing. Um, they still have to have, they are highly charged, and as they actually evaporate further, the charge density increases, which causes them to sort of explode even further. So you essentially get uh, these tiny, tiny ions, hopefully um, uh, things with single charges, mostly in the case of positive ion mode, positive charges. Um, as I say, this is putting to words, but as I say, typically with ESI, you want to have a fluid where you don't have salts. Um, that messes up ESI. Whereas moldy, you can work with uh, salty substances. Um, you push it through a metal uh, capillary, very low flow rates, a strong voltage um, with the gas that's coming around it, uh, causes you to get an aerosol, and then you get this evaporation. So if you have a, a fairly polar solvent, like water with strong hydrogen bonds, uh, you have to apply very, very high voltage, 3,000 volts, to get a spray. If you add a lot of acetonitrile, which is sort of the preferred solvent for a lot of uh, work in, in HPLC, uh, you'll start to see a spray much earlier. If you're dealing with a gradient, you may have to adjust your uh, voltage as the gradient moves through uh, to get the spray that you want. You can change the flow rate, so tens of microliters down to less than a microliter, that's nano spray. Uh, you can get away with very small amounts of material with uh, mass spec. And as I said, things like salts and detergents mess it up. Depending on your carrier solvent, you can get things into a positive ion mode for, like, say, formic acid, or a negative ion mode where you add, say, ammonia. So these are the different approaches for generating uh, your ions to measure your mass to charge ratio, and then you have different mass analyzers, which are used for separating those ions. So the original mass specs use magnetic sector analysis, MSA, but the ones that most of us use these days are either quadrupoles, or triple quads, time of flight, orbi traps, or FTMS systems. And they have different resolution, and we saw some of those pictures of those uh, re resolving power for the different types of instrument. This just puts it to text and a little more, so this is resolution and mass accuracy. So your best is with the FTMS, second best is with Orbi trap. And the cost of these instruments is basically proportional to their resolution or mass accuracy. So the, the cheapest instruments are these ones, typically. The most expensive ones are these ones. These are rarely made anymore. Certainly you'll see all of these and these ones. Um, so mass resolution obviously is important. We'll get to this uh, later on in, the, in our discussions. Um, whether it's GC or LC, we get what we'll call a gas or a mass chromatogram. Um, things are being separated over time. We're detecting things. So um, you're going to see a essentially what we'll call a total ion current chromatogram, uh, which is essentially that intensity where we might measure over time uh, the appearance of, of um, peaks that we're detecting by our mass spec. So the GCMS spe spectra I was showing you actually were, or the GC spectra I was showing you were actually GCMS spectra because the detector wasn't UV, it was, it was MS. And so each of the peaks we were detecting were masses that, that um, were coming off. So we had time and then we had intensity. So same with LCMS, we can have total ion current or tick chromatograms. We can 
simplify those to base peak chromatograms, uh, where we're just displaying the most intensity, or we can have extracted ion chromatograms. And so these are different terms you'll see when people are talking about or displaying their chromatograms, and these are sort of what you'll see in terms of what they associate with those. So if we're looking at, say, a, an ESI chromatogram, this might be for tomato or Arabidopsis, and what's showing here is um, more like the base peak chromatogram. So we're seeing the retention time, 14 minutes, and we're seeing the mass of the most intense peak, 478 Daltons. Here's another one, which is at 17 minutes, and the mass of the most intense peak is 385 Daltons. Now, in many cases, there may be several masses coming out from under these peaks. And you often want to look at those to, de to determine them. Because the resolution of the chromatogram is often not sufficient to separate every single pure compound. Um, but by knowing something about the time and the mass, we can often figure out what the molecule is or perhaps which class it is. So I'm going to switch gears from mass spectrometry to NMR spectroscopy. So how many of you use NMR? You had a question. Just, um, simple question. You talk about different uh, sources, uh, ionizers and then analyzers. How do you make the combination like uh, uh, we said, uh, talk about the detection limit and sensitivity. So the, the best ones are the most expensive, right? So the resolving power. They're not the most necessarily the most sensitive ones. So they're able to uh, allow you to measure high mass accuracy um, down to parts per million. But they're not necessarily the most sensitive. Um, um, sensitivity has to do sometimes with the configuration of the instrument, uh, with the detector system. My question is when we are designing our experiment or our project, so how we Yeah, well, I think it's often defined by availability. Um, the, um, I know of no lab that's equipped with all of the mass specs uh, or of GCMS uh, options. You know, the, that costs tens of millions of dollars. So, um, yeah, it's largely defined by availability of what, what's available to you. If you're happy or situated where you can choose between any of these instruments, um, basically uh, Orbitrap is the one that most people prefer for uh, metabolomics. Um, but um, in order to do complete coverage, uh, and I think maybe the message for today is that you have to use all the different modalities. So even uh, Orbitrap uh, LCMS um, misses a lot of compounds that you can easily detect by NMR. It also misses compounds you can easily detect by GCMS, and it misses a lot of compounds you can easily detect by um, HPLC fluorescence detection. Um, and that's just sort of the nature of, of the thing. Uh, it, if compounds are too abundant or too polar or your separation system doesn't do a good job, you don't see it. If the ions don't fly, particularly things like sugars, don't see it. So things that don't ionize efficiently, um, like sugars, um, like certain other kinds of molecules or glycosylated molecules, just never see them by mass spec uh, or LC mass spec, but you can very easily see them sometimes by, by NMR, uh, by GCMS, HPLC. So um, the coverage you get um, depends on the molecule, depends on the sensitivity of the instrument, um, and as I say, a complete metabolomic study typically means you should try and use all available platforms. Any other questions? Okay, I guess the question is how many people actually have used or do use NMR spectroscopy in their metabolomics? A few of you? Okay. So we'll get into this because typically people who do mass spec never use NMR and people who do NMR never use mass spec. And so 
Uh, well, a number of you were falling asleep while I was talking about mass spec. Um, maybe the people who know about NMR can start falling asleep. But um, NMR produces a, a spectrum not unlike what we see with HPLC, UPLC, GCMS. It's a whole bunch of narrow peaks at different times. What you do in NMR is you put samples under a strong magnetic field and then you send a perturbing radio frequency um, into that sample. And the radio waves are, essentially that's the electromagnetic radiation you're sending in, are differentially or preferentially absorbed. So it's, it's a similar actually to if you've ever used UV spectroscopy. It's just that we're using a different wavelength of light, not, not UV this, but radio waves. And the only way that we can get the absorption phenomena to happen is putting it under a magnetic field. If we don't put the sample under a magnetic field, the absorption phenomena doesn't happen. And we scan and we collect a spectrum just like we would collect a UV spectrum and we get peaks that absorb over the length, wavelengths that we typically see. So you can think of absorbance happening in red end and the green end and the blue end just like in UV vis. And the result is a, an absorbance spectrum. So that's, that's the analogy for NMR. It's an absorbance of radio waves, but you have to condition the sample. So put it under a strong magnetic field so the absorption will actually happen. Now more technically, NMR is looking at nuclear magnetism. Um, so it changes in the nucleus. So it's not a radioactive phenomena. It's just the looking at magnetism in the nucleus. And we're measuring light, radio waves, that are, and that absorption happens due to changes in the nuclear magnetism, which is a result of nucleons having a spin. As I said, it only happens when you're things, uh, putting things under a strong magnetic field. So protons is usually what we look at, um, which are found in hydrogen, which is what most NMR uh, measures these days, um, have a spin. So you can think of protons as a little marble or sphere spinning, and they can spin one way or the other way. So we define it as a, a spin up or a spin down, and this is because protons have a surface charge, and depending on the rotation of their spin, will produce a little magnetic field. So if they have a spin up, the north pole points up. If the spin is down, the north pole points down. So again, you can think of uh, protons or any nucleon as being just a miniature magnet. So when we send in um, radio waves or, or electromagnetic radiation uh, and we have a sample in a strong magnetic field, the radio waves will cause or will interact with the spins and will cause some of them that we're say pointing spin down to go to spin up. So this is a low energy state. It's a, it's a Boltzmann equilibrium, so not everything is pointing down. Some are randomly pointing up. But you put in energy into the system, things go to a higher energy state. They briefly go to that higher energy state, and then they relax over time to their low energy state. So in NMR, we use big magnets. And the bigger the magnet, the stronger the field. Um, essentially, uh, the higher the frequency we can look at. So there are also different types of isotopes uh, that we look at. And so some uh, have a, a low ratio. So even though we put them in a big magnet, they are only equivalent to looking at things in a, in a lower field strength. But increasing a field strength allows us to look at higher frequencies, which also gives us better resolution. So modern NMR, we typically will have samples. These days, often, they have uh, Flow, flow injection systems or robotic systems. You can uh, take a sample out, put it into this big magnet, um, and start collecting uh, data on the sample. Uh, a big radio wave transmitter receiver, that's called a transceiver, it sends signals in, takes the signals out, and that information is then processed in the computer so you can get your spectra. Uh, modern NMR, you can feed a sample in every five to ten minutes, and you can do it day in, day out, uh, looking at hundreds of samples a day. The characteristic of NMR is this big magnet. It's a refrigerator-sized uh, device. Um, they are measured in 
things like 400 megahertz, 500 megahertz, 800 megahertz, gigahertz. Uh, magnets cost anywhere from uh, half a million dollars to 10 million dollars for the very largest ones. Um, they are big containers containing uh, helium, liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. They are superconducting magnets. The magnets function, they're measured at sort of 10, 12, and 20 Tesla. So they're very powerful. They could easily pick up a city bus. Um, but they are as superconducting magnets. They are not electromagnets. They are permanent magnets. But you have to keep them cold. If you don't keep them cold, then they lose their magnet magnetism. So if you're looking at a, a cut cutaway view of, a, of a, an NMR system, you'll see that typically um, there's a liquid nitrogen bath that's on the inside and the outside, and then the very middle is a liquid helium bath. The liquid nitrogen keeps the liquid helium cold. Um, and the liquid helium coats a uh, niobium tin superconducting magnet, which is made up of thousands, hundreds of kilometers of wire that are wrapped around by hand. So a very powerful magnet. And in the, inside the magnet, which might have a bore size of about um, maybe uh, 10 or 20 millimeters, you will stick a probe. The probe um, is what has all of the electronics that allows you to send in radio waves. So this is your probe, electronics, wires going in, and in the center of the probe is what's called a saddle coil. It looks like two wires, one half shaped like one saddle, the other half shaped like another saddle, put the two saddles together, and it allows you to generate uh, an orthogonal magnetic field called B1. Inside the saddle coil, you drop your NMR tube, which is typically about the size of a pencil, very thin tube. And the NMR sample, which is maybe 500 microliters, sits in that saddle coil, and you pulse. Pulse is essentially creating a, a weak magnetic field, which effectively to the sample looks like a radio frequency electromagnetic field which uh, excites or provides energy into the system and allows you also to measure the signal coming out from the tent sample tube. So this is both your transmitter and your receiver that detects or generates the radio waves that go in and detects the radio waves that are absorbed um, inside the sample. So that data then is processed and it produces an NMR spectrum. And the NMR spectrum has chemical shifts, which are the positions here, just like M over Z values for mass or retention times that we use parts per million. We also have a characteristic. So this is one compound, but it has five peaks. Whereas with you know, LC, you'd usually hope one compound, one peak, uh, or LCMS. Um, there's certain splitting patterns, couplings. We have chemical shifts measured in parts per million, and we have peak intensities. The intensities tell us how much. The, the splitting patterns that come from spin, spin coupling, and the frequencies, as I said, are chemical shifts tell us what type of molecule or molecular fragment is there. So NMR is different than mass spec in that NMR uniquely allows you to determine the three-dimensional structure of molecules. You cannot determine the structure of molecules by mass spectrometry alone. Also, in terms of quantification, NMR is far more quantitative than mass spec. So these are two important advantages of, of NMR over mass spectrometry. The reason why we can use NMR to determine structures is because of chemical shifts, Chemical shifts um, tell us the composition because they're very characteristic of certain features and electronegativity of, of the atoms in a molecule. So each compound has a unique fingerprint for chemical shifts. But we can also use and predict chemical shifts with remarkable precision. and It allows us through that and through coupling patterns to figure out what is actually inside a, a brand new or unknown molecule. So chemical shifts for hydrogen or proton NMR range from around 0 to 13 parts per million. And these are the various groups that we can see in many organic molecules, from aromatic groups to uh, carboxylic acid groups to double 
uh, doubly charged or methylene groups or saturated and unsaturated uh, or amines and amides. And these are the positions. So many NMR spectroscopists have this sort of table memorized in their head and they can look at the positions of various peaks and figure out which component is which in a, in a spectrum. The coupling patterns also are uh, uh, uniquely informative. So in this case, um, there's a spin-spin coupling, and I won't get into the theory behind that, but it's essentially you get this splitting. You get a 1 to 2 to 1 intensity. Uh, so there are three hydrogens here. The peak area, the integrated area, is equal to 3 here. The integrated area under this is 2, corresponding to the number of hydrogens. But because there are two hydrogens on this molecule, they cause the hydrogens, chemically equivalent hydrogens here, to split into three peaks. Because there are three hydrogens here, they cause the chemically equivalent hydrogens on this one to split into four peaks. So the n plus one rule. And so again, knowing this and looking for these very characteristic one to three to three to one, or one to two to one patterns, we can determine which hydrogens are where, whether they're uh, methylenes or methynes and so on. So these are all things that, that uh, NMR spectroscopists can do based on chemical shifts and coupling patterns to determine what's there. So in NMR, we assign spectra. We assign each of the hydrogen atoms, in this case, to different compositions. So hydrogen atoms here around this ring all have chemical shifts around seven parts per million. Um, these two hydrogens here have chemical shifts around two and a half parts per million. These ones have chemical shifts around one part per million. And then there's this reference, uh, which in organic chemistry is called tetramethylsilane, not unlike the trimethylsilane we used in, in GCMS. Or we use DSS or TSP, uh, which are water-soluble equivalents of TMS in metabolomics. And these are the reference value that allows you to say this is the zero point. And just like the retention index, it allows you to give a universal chemical shift that everyone can understand, regardless of the make or manufacture of the instrument, regardless of the field that you're working in. So chemical shifts recorded in PPM give you this universal number, a milepost that everyone can understand. NMR spectra are not perfect. Uh, when you get them, um, they have to be fixed up, straightened up. Um, and this is an example of an NMR spectrum when, when you get it initially. And you can see peaks, but it's kind of messed up. Uh, this is the water peak. This is from urea. Uh, you can see things dropping below the baseline. Uh, you can see shifts that are kind of way off the scale. What you need to do, and you'll be doing this in the next uh, uh, section, is you have to reference, adjust things so that they're all calibrated. You have to phase so things don't have these unusual sliding changes. You have to get rid of the water peak. That's called water suppression. You have to shim things so that the shape of the peak is perfectly Lorentzian. And then you have to make sure that this side is at the same height that this side is which is called baseline correction. So these are things that you have to do to manipulate or fix NMR spectra. So this just puts in words to what I was saying here, which is trying to normalize the chemical shifts, just like we did with um, GCMS. Shimming, face, fixing the line shapes. Phasing to make the spectra or the peaks look absorptive rather than dispersive to get rid of big peaks like water, which mess things up, and make the spectra look flat. So this is an NMR spectrum of a biological mixture. And if you took away the, the scale, whether you showed me a GCMS, LCMS, NMR spectra, HPLC, to my eyes, they all look the same. Uh, it's just the scale difference. Um, and all you're trying to do in metabolomics is try and figure out which peaks are which, and how much is there. So there are different technologies, as we talked about. We've covered uh, initially GC and GCMS. Uh, we looked at LC and LCMS. We looked at NMR. Uh, 
Um, NMR is the least sensitive method. Measures concentrations from few micromolar to molar levels. GCMS is slightly more uh, sensitive. Often you can get into sub-micromolar levels, especially with the GC-TOF. Um, most sensitive method is LCMS. Um, so in terms of the number of compounds you can measure by NMR, it's maybe 50 to 100. GCMS, maybe 150 to 200. LCMS, the number of features that people can identify, is sometimes reported in the thousands. I'm getting flagged that we'll have to wrap up soon. I don't speed up, or I've just got a few more slides, I think. Um, so the, the issue here is that when you are measuring in this range, most of the things you're measuring, you actually know what they are. When you're up in this range, most of what you're measuring, you don't know what, what's there. And this is a big problem with metabolomics. So it's the trade-off between sensitivity and what you know. And generally, you can't publish what you don't know. It makes it very hard to publish some of the things that we do by uh, GC or LCMS, especially with the high sensitivity or most sensitive modes. So that's a challenge. That's a, to, it's something that plagues a lot of us in metabolomics. Here's a sort of comparison of the different techniques very quickly. NMR allows you to measure mostly water-soluble things, all kinds of different tissues and samples. Sample volume is generally large. GCMS, you can generally work with smaller sample volumes. Again, the preference is for more soluble things, but also for volatile molecules, things that you smell. And then MS, preference generally for hydrophobic molecules, but you can work with very, very small volumes, which is very appealing. Sample prep time varies for different samples. Uh, there are set examples for DIMS, can be as short as a few minutes per sample. NMR, depending on if you do it manually, 90 minutes automatically, 10 to 20 minutes. GCMS runtime is also relatively slow because the columns are long. Limit of detection, you know, micromolar, hundreds of nanomolar, low nanomolar range. Number of metabolites varies depending on the samples, but generally more with MS, less with these techniques. Um, but there isn't a whole lot of overlap. So what you can easily measure by NMR, you can't measure by MS. What you can easily by, uh, measure by GC, you can't measure by NMR, and vice versa. So using multiple platforms is critical to getting comprehensive coverage. So in the case of NMR, um, depending on the fluid, um, looking at blood or cerebral spinal fluid or cell extracts, you can measure about 50 metabolites. In urine, you can measure up to 200 metabolites, and you can quantify them and identify them. GCMS, uh, typically, when people are reporting both quantitation and identification, the range is somewhere between 50 to 150 compounds. Um, again, depends on the biofluid. Most people don't quantify in GCMS. That's unfortunate. There are kit-based systems for doing um, mass spec that allow you to do quantification and identification, but that's targeted mass spectrometry. You can get into the low nanomolar range. LCMS methods, most of the methods that are used can report uh, up to three or 400 metabolites being identified at the very best. Most are not quantified, which is a problem. Lipidomics, there are techniques that allow you to measure up to 3,000 lipids to, uh, and to semi-quantify them. So lipidomics is metabolomics of lipids. And then if you're looking at, at you know, other secondary metabolites, often you have to use a combination of, of sometimes HPLC-based methods, uh, sometimes uh, specific assays, sometimes specific derivatization methods. Uh, many of them are LC-based, LCMS-based. So to wrap up here, um, Basically, there are two routes to metabolomics. Um, one route is called a targeted or quantitative metabolomics. I prefer the word quantitative because typically it means taking a spectrum, mass spectrum, LC spectrum or chromatogram, an NMR spectrum, and identifying every single peak and quantifying what's there. The other approach is called uh, non-targeted or profiling or chemometric methods, where typically you don't really care what's in here, at least not initially, but you compare the spectra 
and you group the spectra together, and then you use chemometric methods to compare the spectra. And you look to see how the spectra are different. And then from the regions in the spectra that are different, then you'll focus on identifying what those peaks might be. So untargeted, typically take samples, you collect many, many spectra for many, many samples. You perform a data reduction, a principal component analysis, say, to identify the clusters. And then once you've seen if there is a difference and where those differences might be, then you go back and do perhaps your metabolite identification to figure out what caused those differences. The other approach is the quantitative one, whereas every spectrum you analyze for every sample, you identify and quantify. You have a list of metabolites. You use the list of metabolites to do your principal component analysis. And then you go in directly to the biological interpretation. So in either regard, you eventually go from spectra to lists. And when you have your lists of compounds and relative or absolute concentrations, then you go from those lists to pathways. And so what we're going to spend the next day and a half is going how we go from spectra to lists and from lists to pathways. And that's the bioinformatics that we're going to focus on. Um, We'll talk a little bit of how we can actually go from those pathways, perhaps even to models and also to biomarkers, which might be of interest to some of you as well. So there's challenges there, the challenge of getting to lists. We have to worry about data analysis, alignment, normalization, data reduction. And to go to lists and pathways, we'll have to talk about pathway maps and identification and biological interpretation.